And that's the truth, Ruth. What's up, family? We are back. Hello. It is I, Adam Pacora, here for Requiem for Tuesday, edition 23, the Michael Jordan special. Um, look, you know, it's just got to be addressed at this point. Um, uh, I mean, well, I mean, first things first, it's just plain and simple, clear as day that black lives matter. And if you fucking disagree, then you can turn this off and go away forever and go fuck yourself. Um... Yeah, so didn't feel right doing an episode last week. Doesn't really feel right doing one now, but I, I mean, I kind of just need to do this for me. So, I mean, I won't deny any accusations of selfishness here, but I also don't think that uh, I'm really taken away from anybody right now because uh, who gives a fuck about this, you know? Uh, but look, I mean, there's nothing that I could say, Mr. White Guy over here... And it's, I mean, not even that, it's just like, am I really eloquent enough to really get any point across that nobody is like clearly said already? You know what I mean? Like I'm look, I'm fully on board, fully support the movement, been out, uh, on the streets as much as possible, you know, in any of the positive and unlike the media says violent, free, you know, fully peaceful protests been out there doing that when I can, uh, you know, shit like that. Just do whatever you can, you know. Uh, just feels weird to try to go on with the show without saying anything about the current state of affairs, you know, but look, I, I don't have fucking words that are gonna be all magical and I'm not really the person to say them. Uh, I mean, it's just pretty simple to me. I mean, this is like a human issue, you know, so any other stance you have is just really fucking stupid. Uh, and I don't want to hear it, you know, stop valuing anything over people's lives. So whatever your counter argument is to anything that has to be said, it's just like plainly and clearly very wrong and incorrect. I mean, just treat people like people. It's really ridiculous. And like, you don't got to do all of this. Like, I don't know, just, uh, it, it, it's a crazy time. I mean, we have been more divided than ever for the last fucking four years now, so. But, I mean, not that that even has anything to do with it, you know, just thinking about it. I mean, it's been an issue for the entirety of the existence of this country, which is, I mean, just on that alone, it's like, has this place ever been a good place for any for any reason? Like, can you ever really say that anything that we've ever done as a nation is at, is at all even really respectable? Like, should we even be getting any reps? You know what I mean? Like, should anybody be like, this place is fucking awesome? Because it's not. You know what I mean? And it's hard to say, like, when it's in a place that you're from. Like, I don't know what individual specific issues are going on in fucking, like, England or Japan or Australia, whatever, wherever the fuck. Like, I don't know anything that goes on in any private nation. Not that it's private, but you know what I mean. Uh... I can't imagine, I mean, I know for a fact that nobody has this type of policing issue. This is just fucking insane and ridiculous. I mean, why does a dude on a bike need a pistol? You know what I mean? Or I'll never forget when uh, uh, me and my buddy were leaving the the Bears' last playoff game, the infamous double doink. Jesus. It's unfortunate that I even have to relive that memory. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean... The cops, like, walking from Soldier Field, like, through the park back towards, like, the city, there was just hella dudes strapped with automatic weapons. Now, I don't know what weapons or what, like, unless they were in a Call of Duty. I could not recognize one on site, but I'm talking, like, fully automatic-looking machine guns. And if they're not fully automatic, they're definitely high-fucking-powered. Now, tell me how that makes any sense for people leaving a stadium. Like, what are you going to do, mow down the crowd? Like, there's, there's no reason how that could ever help any scenario. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and I, all of this is obvious. Again, I, I don't claim to have any fucking original ideas on this. It's really just fucking... I, I'm on board with any of the logical smart things that go along with what I'm saying. So, uh, not trying to take any credit for any of these ideas. But, I mean, like, yeah. It, it just baffles me. You know, who who needs a pistol that often? Uh, I don't know. I just don't see why every single officer would need one at all times in every scenario. 
You know what I mean? Uh, any non-violent thing, there should not be a gun involved, period. You know, whatever the call is. I don't know. Uh, all of this just makes pretty obvious and clear sense. So, look, everything everything that's happened to all the people that we've lost is fucking pathetic and embarrassing. And uh, nobody should be down with this. Like, we need a radical swift change. Uh, I mean, I, I put some stuff in the description of the last episode. If you want to call it an episode, it was just a little tribute to George Floyd, um, who, by the way, does have some bars. I listened to some of his DJ Screw stuff. If you haven't done that, check it out. Houston's finest, you know what I mean? Just legends going through it, which is pretty incredible he did that. Uh, crazy that, like, Steven Jackson knows the guy. I mean, it's really just insane. Just across the, I mean, I, I, words can't describe how fucking terrible that is. Just go listen to Dave Chappelle, the 846 thing that's on YouTube. That That's really the best way to just convey, you know, all of that shit. I don't know. Again, I don't have the words for it. Other people do. Um, but, you know, I, I just figured I had to say something. I don't want to start the episode off being that, like, fucking ignorant um, it's definitely not like, oh, I did my tribute episode and, oh, I did this, so let's move on. Uh, definitely not the case. Um, like I said, just kind of doing this for my own well-being, you know what I mean? I need to get away for a little bit myself, and if I can do that for other people as well, that would be just fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, if anything I said just now is fucking stupid as fuck, please call me out on it. I don't really know what's... Again, I, I, I didn't really know what to what to go through with there. Just, you know, donate to any causes that are direct support for the movement and uh, sign petitions. And uh, let's get this shit fucking over with. Because, frankly, I mean, the, the fact that we even have to have this discussion is insane. Uh, the fact that people are now just like, oh, that's what Colin Kaepernick was talking about? Don't even get me started on that shit. <laughs> he said it <laughs> you know what i mean it's like you can't be like oh i didn't realize it at the time it's like why because you didn't read you know what i mean like it, you didn't listen it was clear as day the whole time uh, and it's been an issue the whole time you know what i mean um and that's kind of that's kind of what i want to get into oh before i do that in the same realm of how it's been an issue the whole time um I just want to throw out some music wrecks that happened in the in the time between I've last done it because two great rap collaboration projects have dropped. Um, the more talked about one, I feel like, would be Run the Jewels 4. I feel like they've kind of lost. They kind of lost me a little bit. I feel like I'm more of a fan of everybody involved individually. You know, like LP Killer, my, even like Zach, uh, all the features and stuff. I don't know. It's just like, if it was a yearly thing, like the first two, when it was like year after year, back to back, it just had way more impact. Uh, and I don't know. I feel like they don't have a lot of re-listening power. Like, first listen, I feel like every time, it's fucking incredible. Um, I personally don't even know any songs on the third one. I don't even remember it. So, um, But like, yeah, it, it's good, and it, it has like... Some cool shit in there. LP's production feel I feel like is the weakest one yet for for LP standards. Still very good, um, but it, it definitely overshadowed fucking Alfredo by Freddie Gibbs and the Alchemist, which I would call album of the year so far. If you haven't listened to that shit, go fucking listen to that shit. It's fucking magic. Um, both albums though do feature like lyricism that I'm hesitant to say is relevant to right now because it's relevant at all times, which is the point that. You know, everybody who makes art about this shit, you know, who has discussed it before is would tell you that. Uh, but in, in having said that, <clears throat> it is more pertinent now than ever as like, um, I don't know, like it, it was always relevant and accurate. And, uh, you know, there's fucking thousands of examples of it being talked about in songs and movies and so many things throughout the years that we've all watched that it's like you know the fact that this is like an eye-opening realization for some people or so they claim uh is pretty insane to me but yeah so i mean i wouldn't call it 
it wasn't like made for now, but unfortunately, uh, it's really applicable. Um, but uh, it is just a phenomenal record. Uh, two of the Griselda boys are on there. Benny the Butcher, I think, is the best rapper in the game right now and comes through with the hottest fucking feature ever. Uh, so that's my album of the year so far. So just go peep those. Um, I had to do that quick because I've realized that for whatever reason, I may have mentioned this before, as I always may have for anything ever. Uh, it, it's just hard to, to talk about music and like have jokes in there at the same time. I don't know what that is. I guess it's hard to talk about anything that's good and like make fun of it. But I don't think that that's the issue. There's just there's some line that I need to find a way to cross to where I can talk about some hot shit, but also, you know, drop some bars of my own. You know what I mean? Some of those those good humor bars. See what I mean, though? I mean, shit like that just writes it fucking self. Um, so yeah, let, let's, let's 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 dive into the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna be pretty topical. I feel like anyway. Um, but yeah, please let's not ignore any of the shit that's going on for any minute. Uh, if you wanna or not for any minute, let's please ignore things that are going on for a couple minutes a day at least. Uh, please, you owe that to yourself. Everybody does. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna stay uh, stay stay relevant, but uh, you know, let's not be somber. Although it is a time to be, let's not for like right now. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I don't need to tiptoe around this shit. I will say though, on, on one side note, before I actually get started again, I'm gonna keep. I'm just gonna keep derailing this i'm gonna see if i can say okay wait let's get started but i'm gonna finish the episode first and we'll never actually get started it'll just be you know what i mean it'll be like one of those dubstep tracks (laughs) but the drop never comes i know i probably just scared some raver boy or girl but you know sometimes that drop never comes kids next thing you know you're 28 you got a kid? Where's the other where's the other parent, you may ask? They're nowhere to be found. They're still raging hard. And then you'll have to pick up all the pieces. <laughs> so <laughs> you just think about that, okay, before you wanna go to that warehouse. Um but what I was gonna say is like uh I find it almost adorable when people are like so overtly just like I don't know if it's just, like, a white guilt thing or just, like, so afraid of, like, making someone angry or upset. And I just find it so funny when you just have to, like, when people overcompensate so hard and, like, the kente cloth bullshit, like, in the White House, it's like, bro, that is not a thing that is being asked to happen at all. You know what I mean? It's just, like, just treat these people with respect and equality. It's really that simple uh, like acknowledge abilities and artwork and absolutely like elevate and businesses and elevate all that stuff. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. Um, but you don't got to like throw your jacket over a puddle. Like any time a black person needs to cross the street, you know what I mean? Just like respect them. <laughs> I mean, you do not have to like the grand gestures. I'm sure seem, I mean, some of them are very, very nice. And cool, and that's great. Um, But we need, like, legal action to happen. So, yeah, I don't know. I just find that humorous. Um, I did find myself in the mood, kind of, I mean, unfortunately, obviously, given the current national climate and uh, issues we're combating with, but... The bright side is that uh, it led to the inspiration to watch Do the Right Thing again. I haven't seen this movie in probably like six years or something, at least at this point. I hadn't seen it. The fir- uh, Okay, a little bit of backstory. The first time I saw this movie, I did not like it. I didn't get it. I thought it was weird. I was too young is really what the issue was. 
you know what I mean? Like, it, it was a point where I'd only seen, like, mainstream Hollywood master movies. I was like, I don't know how old I was. Whatever, however old I said I was, I was younger. For sure. Like, the first, first time I saw this, I was probably, like, 11 or something. Uh, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, I, you know, the dialogue goes in and out because I was a child. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the fuck these people are talking about. None of this makes any sense to me. Like, why is this a movie? You know what I mean? Cause, uh, for most of it, it's pretty loose in like story and structure. I got, by the way. The I since I rented this I rented this movie on YouTube you can watch it for like two days, so I watched it very thoroughly and closely and then the next day I watched it heavily heavily heavily, uh, dosed on THC if we want to word it, uh, <laughs> in legal jargon, and uh, that and that left me with some theories which. I'm going to circle back to in a second. Yeah, we'll circle back. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it's very bold. It's very distinct, like visually even. Um, And it's very unique. And first view, couldn't handle it. Watched it again later, definitely understood. Understood it, period. I mean, I guess I just genuinely didn't understand it when I was a kid. Um, And then, yeah, I don't know. But didn't, didn't get... Didn't get the acclaim to the level to which it was at. That was later. So anyway, it took me a while to get used to the movie, but uh, on the on the, immediately from the second I pushed play uh, the other day was so sucked in, and I'm like, I I should have been watching this at least yearly. You know, for the past few years, because it was just what a treat. I mean, good enough that I could watch it two days in a row and was like excited to do so. Uh, I was like, I cannot wait to get home. I'm immediately going to put this on. You know what I mean? It was like, I- I'm psyched for for tonight. So definitely slept on that. If you haven't seen this movie, I mean, turn this off right now and just go rent it. Go illegally. Wa- However you need to watch it. I mean, you should support. But does money even go to Spike Lee from it? If the answer is yes, then absolutely go pay. But if you're just feeding studio cash, then if you know if you can figure out that info, go do what you got to do. Just see the fucking movie. Uh, one of the biggest perks that it has for itself, I think, was a complete... I mean, probably wasn't an accident at the time. Or maybe it was, because it was a very small movie. Uh, Anyway, it was just the timelessness of the cast. So, if you're not familiar from this point on, just spoiler warning, I'm talking about this thing wide fucking open, by the way. Um, if if, If you care, the movie's 30 fucking years old. Plus, I think it was 89. Yeah, it was 89. So, 31 years old. So, if you haven't seen it, go fuck off. Just go watch it. Uh the the cast is unbelievable. So there's like mother sister and the mayor are like a legendary married comedy duo. So that that's not going to jump out at you, um but their chemistry is undeniable, which I watched some making up thing and Spike Lee was like, "Yeah, I pretty much just needed an excuse for them to do their thing." <laughs> so that part was kind of like doing itself, which is dope and uh a great call cuz it works flawlessly. Um, you got the three dudes who are just sitting talking bullshit all day. Absolutely love those guys. Um, sweet Dick Willie. <laughs> but you got, what is his name, Burrell in The Wire? I don't remember, but I fucking absolutely despise his character in The Wire. He fucks every, I mean, obviously that's the point. He's very antagonistic. But what a phenomenal actor, because usually... Just somebody playing a good enough antagonist is enough for me to be like, fuck that human being, <laughs> right? Like, I wouldn't be happy to see that guy um, just because I'm going to keep saying Burrell. I, I really should have looked up whether or not that was his character, but just because Burrell was such a slimy fuck, I fucking hated that guy. Uh, but he was funny as hell. And uh, Martin Lawrence, first appearance, Rosie Perez, first appearance. She wasn't even going to be an actress. 
like ever probably if it wasn't for this. So thank God for Spike Lee. Just just for that, just for giving us Rosie Perez alone. Because Jesus, Rosie Perez in 1989, crazy. I mean, don't even get me started. Uh, but if I mean, if you want to talk fucking TV villains, the gr- arguably the greatest TV villain of all time, Giancarlo Esposito, Gus Fring. You know, almost un- I mean, unrecognizable if you're going to compare the two for so many obvious reasons. Um, but I, I, I didn't even realize that that was him. I mean, I looked at the cast list before I watched it, and I was like, oh, shit. That makes so much sense to me now. Uh, great to see him. I mean, John Turturro, has he ever, has he ever failed? You know what I'm saying? Like, he may have been, I'm 100% sure, in some bad movies, but has he ever been bad? That remains to be seen. You got the fucking... The fucking valet parking garage guy from Ferris Bueller playing his brother. Sorry, I don't know your name. You got uh, another character actor. Don't know his name. Don't really know any other roles. I'm just going back to HBO television. You got the cop, the Hispanic cop. He played the tequila guy in Entourage, if I remember correctly. Definitely seen him in a bunch of shit. I mean, it's just really like you're going to recognize so many faces. That's just... A huge up right there that your cast list has aged phenomenally well. It's like freak. It's not. I, I was going to say it's like freaks and geeks. It's probably not on freaks and geeks level just because the sheer number of success stories out of that show is insane. But it, it's that type of thing where it's like, holy fuck, this cast was too stacked. Like to have a main cast be pretty stacked and it's like four or five people is crazy. But to have a full ensemble just be just be stacked with hitters top to bottom is super impressive. Uh, and they filmed this shit like on location. Apparently it was a dangerous place at the time and they had to hire like Black Panthers, which is so sick that you would do that and that's the best way to do it to like chill the drug dealers out while they were filming. And they filmed it all on one block. And really just it's just looking at this thing. Everything visually is perfect in this movie. So my natural comparison kind of goes back to two movies I talked about recently with like Parasite and Citizen Kane. I would put it with those in like name a flaw. You can't. So it's really just how much do you like this? Right? Because that, that was the example I gave with Parasite. It's like I could, I can complain about a couple things. You know what I mean? Like things that just didn't work for me, but did they do anything at all to ever make you deviate from that thought? Like, not that thought, but did they ever do anything to make you think like, oh, that was bad? Absolutely not. Like everything is done to perfection. It's well written. Well, you know, well, everything. Uh, Same thing goes with Citizen Kane. Same thing goes with Do the Right Thing. Now, if we're going to rank those three movies, I put Do the Right Thing at one. You know, watching, see, I always get in a case of a, like, I just watched this, so I'm going to rank it really high, itis. Um, but I genuinely, while watching Do the Right, the reason why I was so excited to watch it again was like, um, I could not believe how unbelievable that was. Like, if you look at me and you said, Adam, it's unbelievable. Sometimes I'll be like, oh, I, I believe that. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, the steak. It was unbelievable. I'm like, wow. That's great. Which means I believed that it was unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? But this movie was so unbelievable that I didn't even believe how unbelievable it was. You know what I mean? It was like uh it was it was like when the fucking like when the Patriots came back against the Falcons. It was like, did I just watch that? I'm not entirely sure, Uh, but wow, I'm thrilled. That was magic. So (laughs) if if that makes sense, that's kind of where I was at with this. Um, I just mean like, like, okay, first of all, let's just break it down onto little levels. I mean, just like the colors of everything were perfect, like the saturation of everything. Uh, It takes place on the hottest day of the year. It looks sweltering. And (laughs) that... As easy as it may sound to be like, wow, they did a great job of conveying the heat. It's central to the plot of the movie, so I would hope that they do. 
how often does it do you ever even think about the weather in a movie? Like if it's snowing and there's snow, you're like, oh, it's cold. You know what I mean? But how often do they actually convey the feeling of that? You know what I mean? That was one of the things like with The Revenant. It was like, that guy's cold. <laughs> uh, it helped that I saw that movie on like a zero degree day. Um, I'll never forget. We walked out of the theater. I didn't have like, it was so cold out that like I was just freezing, like walking from the theater to the car. And I'm like, dude, I've never felt more soft in my entire life. Because, like, you can't watch a movie about a guy going through the most amount of hell you could possibly imagine in, like, the 1700s <laughs> or whatever. And then you're just like, yeah, it's it, it's pretty cold. You're just going from, like, a nice indoor place to another moving vehicle. You know what I mean? Ultimate softness. So, fuck you, <laughs> Leonardo, for making me feel like that. But also, anybody who wants to talk shit about that movie, you can come talk to me first. Because it's a great flick. But I mean, yeah. So, like, everything looks fucking fantastic. The The costumes are all amazing. Um, Spike Lee, not a great actor by any means uh, in this. Uh, but he didn't really need to be. I mean, he wrote the movie. He wrote himself a part that makes him more of a facilitator, right? It's Mookie goes around the neighborhood and you get to see everybody around the neighborhood via his travels. Right. So that's cool. I mean, he kind of made himself point guard. He didn't really need to do that much. He never has that many lines to deliver at once. Um, yeah, I don't know. And plus, let me give Spike Lee credit, bro. 1989 Spike Lee was fresh to death, at least in that movie. Like his cut looks good. His outfits are all good. He looks fucking. He looks good. You know what I mean? Like he just looks good on screen. So I, I don't know who else would have played that role. That could have rocked that look. I think that that's a huge part. Uh, and I mean, also, what's just great about this movie is the timelessness of it. And unfortunately, with the ending as well. But the whole thing, uh, it could take place today. I mean, it's very intentionally set in 1989. The fashion is offshore, whatever. The cars are weird. You know what I mean? But, like, this isn't a movie that where, like, having a cell phone would have made it any different. I think the only thing that would have been, I mean, well, the thing that would have been different about this movie is people would be filming what happens at the end with Radio Rahim. But other than that, let's let's take a break away from the sad truth to that part. Uh, everything else goes well. I mean, it's just people outside on a hot day. No Phones don't make a difference. You know, the people sitting on the stoop are maybe looking at the screen instead of just staring. You know, something subtle like that. But everybody in this movie, top to bottom, is fucking fantastic. It's great. And the the theory that I came up with, which, I mean, I don't know how much of a theory it is. It's pretty clearly kind of laid out in the story, but I'm going to lay it out anyway. So, I think... That, well, okay, also, I think it goes without saying that this movie does a great cho- job of just showing the complexities of how racism works in America. I mean, this movie isn't, like, trying to do, it's not trying to tell, like, some kind of inspirational thing. It's, like, very thought-provoking, but it's also very real and reflective, you know, so it does it it like does a great job of showing both sides of the coin. I mean, a great and subtle example of like how how the story ends up going is uh, when the kids are playing with the fire hydrant and they spray that fucking dude, one of those that that Italian guy who's another fucking solid ass member of this cast. Uh, what's he in? Probably everything about the mafia ever. You know, I would assume that it's a guy from The Sopranos. I still got to get through it. I'm sorry. Uh, But the cops show up, and they don't give a fuck about, you know, like, catching anybody that did that. And rightfully so. I mean, chill the fuck out. You know what I mean? But they're there to stop the fire hydrant, and the dude is like, y'all better fucking stop this, or I'm going to come beat the shit out of you next time. The officer who ends up killing Radio Rahim at the end. Uh, And it just goes to show, he's like, 
values the water more than the people and then at the end while the pizzeria is on fire they spray everyone with fire hoses uh so it just goes to show you like it, it's a good conversation of like wh- what matters to who in these situations and like what should definitely not that you know what i mean um and it's just very it, it, no movie shows things like that, like in subtleties. I, but the the worst thing about this movie to me is it ruins other Spike Lee movies by them being not as good. You know what I mean? It's like I want this movie. Like this movie is so good that I assume that every Spike Lee movie is going to be this crazy. Now he has a lot at this point, and I have not seen a majority of them, so I'm not going to comment. Like, the dude's filmography is fully flawed. Uh, I've seen some great ones. I mean, as recently as Black Klansman was phenomenal. Uh, I didn't watch The Five Bloods yet. Plan to. What I did see from it, though, uh, the effects look pretty spotty. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't affect the movie and there's not that much of them because they don't look very good. So that that, that leaves me a little hesitant. But I did also watch... I'm going to get back to do the right thing in a second. I did also watch... He got game, which I'd been excited to watch because it's like, okay, let's let's see some sports for fucking once in my life, please. It's been so long, and I will say the basketball that we do see in it, pretty pretty good, well done for a movie, especially uh, Ray Allen, horrendous actor, absolutely horrendous, not believable for a second, really. Uh, so I'm sorry, Ray Allen. But uh wasn't good. It just wasn't good. I couldn't take it. Denzel, of course, was Denzel was amazing. Uh his plot with his side plot with the hooker thing was so stupid, didn't need to happen. Cut that whole thing, the movie gets way better. Um But also it kinda like in Do the Right Thing where they have those little like segues and like side things. I don't need also, oh man, I am in such an inception loop that I'm gonna have to back up and try to like wrap this thing and tie it all back together but that's the challenge that i create for myself here and we don't hold back and we don't shy away uh but what i was gonna say is that uh as much as it's said to be a slacker inspiration i haven't seen slacker so i can't comment on that so if that was a Slacker inspiration, I would guess that Slacker was inspired by Do the Right Thing, but I don't know that. But anyway, uh, just in Clerks, what I was getting to, I noticed that the similarities between that and Do the Right Thing and that like the plot will happen, but then they'll do like little side, almost skits that I just referenced. Like uh, in Clerks, it'll be like, oh, they're talking about what type of customers, you know, and then they do... Those customers who are like like the chick standing next to the thing asking how much it is, but there's a big thing with the price, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or then they do like the milkmaid egg thing, whatever. So there's a few of those. Like little vignettes that are tied to the story still, but not like they're tied to the plot, but they're not central to it. You know what I mean? Anyway. Yeah, so that happens to do the right thing. I feel like Clerks got that from there. That, that was all I was really trying to say. I don't know why I... Acted like there was more. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> but I will say, much like going back to He Got Game, because yeah, that was the only thing. But uh, much, much like a young Rosie Perez. Wow, Rosario Dawson, 1998, and He Got Game. Insane. Uh, arguably even harder to handle. You know, so you know, just big ups. <laughs> to Spike Lee's casting. Because if I can say anything about Spike Lee, he can cast a fucking movie. For sure. Uh, cause, except for Ray Allen. But I, I'm sure it seemed like the, a good idea at the time. I know he wanted Kobe. That movie is a million times better if that's Kobe. Ray Allen just doesn't have the charisma, period. He's a soft-spoken guy. I I guess it made sense for the character of Jesus, though, but I don't know. And also, like, the mother's death. Could have spent a little more time thinking on that. 
That's all I'm saying. That shit was lame, bro. It just was not good. Uh, so yeah, d- disappointed in that movie. Overall, I would say. The ending, pretty spot on and, ex- you know, a little predictable, I would say. Uh, but in a movie based on an unrealistic scenario, they they certainly nailed a realistic ending to that scenario. So, yeah, just wanted to throw throw that in there. Uh, I, I would say skip it, frankly. Unless you want to see some of that Rosario Dawson. Uh, but there's definitely some good parts to it. There's definitely, like, like it just could have been a lot better. Uh, even with the movie as is, definitely could have uh, used some cutting down. Chop that boy up. That movie probably should have been about an hour 20, hour 30. I don't know how long it is, but I'm guessing a lot longer than that. It certainly felt like it. Uh, but yeah, I, I did, it did do a great job of showcasing how hard it could be to be a basketball star though. And like what these kids have to go through and deal with, especially from a lower income area. You know what I mean? Like the message it conveys and the things that it shows very unique. And I assume really accurate as to how fucking terrible that would be to be like a number one recruit. Uh, just have everybody around you with your hands out and shit. Also shows the fun side of it when Ray Allen is just like crushing Poon <laughs> like throughout the movie. Uh, so yeah, it, it, kind another thing that is like do the right thing. It does get to it does show both sides. Let me tell you, <laughs> uh, some of them are pretty great, some of them are not. But whatever. So that was cool. Like credit where credits due, but overall, eh, I'll, I'll pass. Get it? Like basketball. Anyway, we complete the psycho loop-de-loop and come back to do the right thing. So my theory, uh, <laughs> I, I really don't like that I'm calling it a theory, but my theory is this. Okay, so Mookie and his sister uh, are clearly very close, but there is no sign of parents there. Now they're adults. So it's not like they should be living with their parents necessarily. Uh, But they're nowhere to be found. And they're not discussed or talked about. Again, it's just about a single day. Like, it's like a day in the life type of thing. So, I mean, again, it's not really relevant. But it seems as if Sal is their father figure from the pizzeria. Now, I think that this is supported in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that this is the central part of the whole movie, and it all goes unsaid in my head. This is this is how I viewed it, uh, blazed out of my mind. So, could be totally incorrect, and I could be taking a total shot in the dark here. But this makes a lot of sense to me, and I think boosts the movie. So, I think that something happened to their parents. Um, could be as simple as just they were bad parents. Maybe there was only one parent. Maybe something happened to that parent. Who knows whatever the scenario was. Um, probably not good for the kids. Or maybe they were both around and it just was not a good environment. You know, million scenarios for that to happen. Very unfortunate. I think that Sal took them in in some capacity. You know, who knows if they like... I don't think they ever lived with them. But Sal definitely, I think... At, throughout some number of years and for a long time has helped this family out. Um, Jade, Mookie's sister, I mean, also Spike Lee's real sister, which explains their chemistry. Mookie's best, or I guess Spike Lee's best acting is probably when he's interacting with her, but that's because I think that you know what I mean? They just have such a rapport from actually being family. Um, so another just great casting choice. But Jade says at one point, uh, talks about how Moogie, this is the only job he's been able to keep for more than a month, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can just kind of tell by Moogie's thing. Yeah, he's all about getting paid. He's all about fucking, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of Moogie's thing. Um, my guess is when... Hector came into play when Moogie's like, oh my god. I would assume that Sal had told him throughout the years, 
you've always got a spot here. You know, if you ever need a gig, let me know. Blah, blah, blah. Something to that extent. And my thing is, like, when that kid happened, he was probably like, Sal, I got to cash in that favor. Let's do that. So my theory is kind of that's how they started actually, like, working, working together. But I think that they always had a familial thing where Sal has always kind of been Mookie's father figure. Um, And I think that that is where... John Turturro's racism really, really comes from. I think that as the older brother of the two, he knows that he can boss his brother around, smack him around, do whatever. Um, And I think that that's why he thinks he hates the place. Like, he wants to move the pizza place because he knows that Mookie won't... Like, you know what I mean? If they did move it to their neighborhood, Mookie wouldn't work there anymore. And... He's really, I think that he is really just jealous that Mookie is treated like a son and gets passes as he does because he's the older brother. He deserves like the most respect and the most credit and blah, 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 blah in his head, right? It's all fucked up and wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not defending the guy. Um, This is also made up, possibly. I hope I'm 100% right. That would be great, but probably not because, I mean, let's just be real. I'm not Spike Lee, so it's not for me to say. Somebody call Spike Lee. Get him on the phone. After I finish this whole thing, let's <laughs> let's get this confirmed. He can tell me I'm stupid, and we can move on. Um, so yeah, I mean he 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 doesn't hate he doesn't hate the place. He doesn't hate the pizza. He doesn't hate any of that shit. Yeah, I think he just hates Mookie. And when you're stupid and misguided, eh, it's easy to just turn that into like fucking full blown racism, which is terrifying and wrong and stupid. Again as said, but I think that that's where it comes from, and I think that that's why when Sal originally, like, tries to take the bat to bugging out for, like, causing a ruckus, he takes it out of his hand, because he doesn't, I don't think he actually wants anything bad to happen to anybody, I think he just wants his dad to be his dad, you know what I mean? Because his dad seems to just care about the pizza place, which is the only time we see that side of Sal as well. Like, he respects everybody as long as they respect the pizza place. You know what I mean? Like, his thing is, this is my place. I do my things my way. I like everybody in the neighborhood. I like everybody around, unless they fuck with the pizza thing. You know what I mean? He's He has no problem with anybody unless they fuck with his business, um, which is still incorrect and still wrong. You know, goes without saying. Uh, it's like people versus property, you know, same issues we have now. And that's where like the anger and shit comes out of Sal. I, I do think that, um, he, he does not want to go to that place, but that side of him does exist, which is dark and fucked up. Um, but another good way of showing two sides of the coin. Like, I, I don't think that, I don't think that Sal thinks he's racist. Just as Danny Aiello says, he doesn't think that Sal's racist. <laughs> Uh, but he, he, I mean, he is, It's and it's deep within him, and it comes out at the worst, I mean, there's no good time for it to come out, certainly, it shouldn't be there at all, um, but it only comes out in escalation and things like that, and he, um, clearly just want he wants to defend what is his own thing, um, and it's just unfortunate, and I think that that also helps fuel John Turturro's thing, though. He's like, Dad, like, you know what I mean? You got they're, they're, they're stopping each other all the time because when Sal has the... Sal also has that argument with... Um, oh, I think it's Bugging Out again. <laughs> uh, but he's like, when uh, Bugging Out comes back to explain that he's boycotting and then they have that interaction, Totoro kind of follows him. And he's like, dude, what are you doing? Come inside. Like, I have this under control. Because to him, he's just like proving as a business owner, that he is in control of his pizzeria. There's nothing else behind it at that point. But Totoro's like, okay, Dad, like, I got your back on this one. I'm going to also try to intimidate this guy. And he's like, no, dude. You know what I mean? It's like he, they can never be on the same page. And I think that that drives Totoro for it even more, especially um, with the Mookie stuff. And, you know... Totoro keeps pointing out that Mookie doesn't work that hard, blah, 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 blah. And uh, he kind of doesn't. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, at least on this day, hottest day of the year, though, it does make sense that he wouldn't 
be like fucking super hustling about it, but I think it's implied that he kind of does take liberties with it, which I think further fuels the fire of the familia. You like that alliteration theory that I have going on? And uh, I think that that's why at one point, Sal's is like, dude, Mookie, you're fucking up, bro. Like, you can't be doing this shit. And he says it to him a couple times where he's kind of just like, I mean, he's right. You know, I, I can't like that. Again, it's like a business first thing. It's like I want to rep Mookie, but whatever. And then by the end of the day, well, no, not even by the end of the day, then Jade comes in and he's like, I'm going to make you some special blah, blah, blah. And he sits and he like fawns over her. And it does kind of seem like it might be creepy, but I think. The fact that she says it's not, I think it means knows that she understands something. Because throughout the movie, Jade is a voice of reason for everybody. Uh, She sees bugging out on the street and he explains the whole scenario with the Wall of Fame. And she's like, bro, um, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. (laughs) You know what I mean? She's like, I would like to see positive changes in our community. I don't really care who's on the wall. And... You know, there's a reason why the dude's name is bugging out. I mean, he kind of tripped about nothing. Um, but I do also think that Jade's reasoning for that and Mookie's reasoning for agreeing with that is their ties to Sal. But that is also correct. And Jade is the later the is the voice of reasoning right after when she talks to Mookie about it because he's like, yo, stop trying to bang my sister in his head, <laughs> you know? And she's like, Mookie, it is not like that. Um, and I think that, you know, like from the Godfather and shit, like Italian men just love their daughters in such a way. And I think Sal never had one. So Jade is his daughter. And I think that that's where like that that's where it all kind of clicked. This whole thing that I'm thinking of kind of clicked for me. It's like, oh, he she is just the daughter he never had. And he isn't particularly nice to Mookie because he treats him as like his kids. Because the key thing throughout the movie is just that like, I feel like he treats Mookie just as equally as he treats his other sons. I say other there. Support my own theory. Um, And I also think that that is why Mookie is okay with some of the racist things being said. Not okay with it. Um, but I think the reason why he doesn't freak out and like do shit about it, especially with Totoro's character, is because that's his brother on some level. You know what I mean? And I th- also think that that's why Totoro's comfortable saying it to him because it's his brother. Because if you notice, he doesn't do it outwardly to anybody else. This could be really heavily reading into it. I don't know. Um, but it that just all seems to really click. And... Yeah, I don't know. He it just seems he just seems like that's that's a fatherly thing. And then at the end, obviously they have that conversation. It's kind of coded, uh, which I read was a choice, and it's a good choice. They don't need to spell that shit out. Uh, but the interaction they basically have is like, you know, if you ever got into like a crazy fight with your dad, <laughs> um, and just even more complicated because this one also involves like racial politics. So, and like watching somebody get murdered. But the fact that Mookie was even able to normally talk with that guy, I, I think just go, I think that that's what's being conveyed there. Um, but yeah, that's my big take on, <laughs> on uh, what I think the relationship dynamics are and do the right thing. So, for nobody who was interested in that part of it. There you go. Uh, but I mean, the cinematography was spectacular. Oh, that got weird. Because I was holding the mic a little bit. Does it sound like I'm on the radio in the 40s? And Secretariat comes down the stretch. Uh, I know Secretariat didn't happen in the 40s. So fuck off. Don't give me that shit. But yeah, the cinematography was unbelievable. Every shot, every composition is like totally gorgeous throughout the movie, which is huge for me every time. They definitely put a lot of thought into it. And there's plenty of shots where it goes like in and out of a building, like through a window, and it's all seamless. Like the camera work in this movie is as good as you will ever find. Um, And so many, yeah, so many of the compositions are great, like where they do the shot of just the street with like chalk on it. And then Mookie walks across it through the frame and it's almost like interacting with an image 
Um, the whole title card intro with Rosie Perez just fucking doing her thing, dancing her ass off um, with Fight the Power playing. Amazing. Um, I didn't know that that was an original song for the movie until this point. You know, you'd hear, you'd hear, you'd hear that song a million times uh, throughout your life, throughout my life, which has existed entirely post Do the Right Thing. Uh, so, I mean, just keep fucking adding to the list as far as it goes. Um, I also do want to mention another thing, like, and just like the relevancy of like so many little things, you know what I mean? Like they talk about Jordans, um, the crew, I don't know any of the characters names in that crew, but like Martin Lawrence and the, the, he's with like two other dudes and a chick and they're just kind of walking around town. Um, they talk about like Black Panther and the dude has a comic book and it's like, People already weren't talking about comic books. They especially weren't talking about Black Panther. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Mookie is wearing a Michael Jordan jersey, which, huge respect for Spike Lee for that. I know that they did, like, the commercials together. I assume this was beforehand. Um, Because, yeah, he mentioned he was in the movie because it helped sell sell the movie. He's like, I- I'm not an actor, which is cool that he admits that. He's like, I'm in the movie, so this movie could get made, which is dope. Uh, but he is wearing a Michael Jordan jersey. Pretty big dig at the Knicks right there. Also, pretty big rep to MJ. Respect that. Um, but could not be more relevant, as <laughs> Michael Jordan hasn't been talked about this much since, shit, probably since he came back from retirement. One of the times. You can pick which one. Uh, but I mean for the Wizards. Uh, the list really just goes on and on and on. The score is unbelievable. It was done by Spike Lee's dad. It's just like jazz stuff. You pretty much only hear the song Fight the Power and then like really nice jazz things. Um, all of those little intercuts, they do like the racial slur thing. Like one of those little vignettes is good. Um, it's just visually striking. Like all these Dutch angles with like the slanted camera can be really disorienting and very strange, but it's always very artistic and always very well composed. And uh, <clears throat> it is just beautiful to watch and listen to. And uh, everybody crushes it top to bottom. Um, the Radio Rahim thing where they just kind of interact, but then it turns into the love versus hate speech is incredible. Um, the way it's all tied together with Smiley, you know, uh, it really just absolutely flawless. Um, I was talking about They Live recently and its relevancy and Do the Right Thing just blows that relevancy right out of the water. Um, again, a, a, in an unfortunate way, but it, you know, the shit hasn't changed and that's unfortunate. And Spike Lee was just trying to show everybody, like, what that shit was like. Um, I uh, I listened to the the Rewatchables podcast on the movie, and uh, which is a phenomenal podcast on the Ringer Network, which is a phenomenal network, my favorite website, absolutely. Um, but Sean Fennessy made a good point that I noticed... I only noticed after him saying it um, that Sweet Dick Willie, well, he was <laughs> hilariously was talking shit about how he could beat up Mike Tyson. And this is 1989. That's like peak of his powers, Mike Tyson, if my timeline's correct. Maybe. Either way, at the time, the man was definitely very dangerous. Uh, like that conversation happening now would still probably be ridiculous, even if those men were the same age as they are in the movie now. Uh, you probably still couldn't kick Mike Tyson's ass. So that is so funny to me. And works really... That's the thing. Like Everything just happens to work really, really well. And like it just managed to be super timeless. But he says, knock me out in a dream, better wake up and apologize. And then that was a... That's Harvey Keitel's line in Reservoir Dogs, and he noted that there is like a rivalry between the two, and that is a very interesting point to consider. Um, could just be one line. I think that there were more examples given, but that is still uh, probably just a dope homage. I mean, knowing Tarantino's thing, I don't think that 
he would call anything stolen or he would say like, yeah, I stole that from that movie. That's a great movie. What a great line, you know? Um, but I guess you could argue what is theft and what is an homage. I mean, just cause you liked it doesn't mean you get to use it. You could argue that. I don't really fucking know, but that was an interesting point. Just wanted to throw in there. Um, and yeah, as much as unfortunate as it is, the entire ending sequence that goes from smashing the boombox all the way through Radio Rahim's unfortunate death and the the burning down of the pizzeria, it is all just phenomenally done. And I feel like it would be really hard to show that kind of a scuffle, um, especially like the actual death itself and the... Could not have nailed it more, and it seemed like it's eerily similar to the George Floyd scenario. Not the death as it physically, like he didn't kneel on the man. That's about the only difference, but uh, yeah, painful to watch. And uh, the way they handle it is pretty much exactly how it would go down. Um, Nothing in it seems unrealistic, and that's frightening. And people at the time didn't get it. Uh, I mean, shit, people fucking last year didn't get it. People fucking four months ago didn't get it. People still don't fucking get it. And uh, that's frightening and terrifying, and it is, it's holding everything back. You know? It just drives me... It just makes me so angry that <laughs> you could possibly be on the other side. Um... Like, the fact that there are videos ask like, I saw, like, video essays and shit asking if Mookie did the right thing. The answer is yes. If your answer is no, it's because he should have let them fucking tear Sal apart. And I guess I can't blame you for that. Um, but I do think that uh, destroying Sal's is the perfect compromise because if we're going to defend Sal for anything in this movie, it's that he did not kill anybody he broke a fucking boombox which is really not cool and pretty fucked up and he deserved to get his ass kicked for doing so um but he certainly didn't call for any murder to happen and didn't murder anybody and i think mookie understood that part of it uh better than anybody but again i think that there's a little bit of family bias going on there um but sal himself he's not he's like dude that, i didn't want that guy to fucking die but they shouldn't have came in here trying to protest me like we're fucking close huh? you know what i mean they're basically like dude all of these factors came into play that led to all this happening and they kind of just come to some crazy understanding um I, well, that's the best thing about the movie i think is just the fact that there is dialogue that exists like I don't feel like I could speak to anyone with an opposing view and have a conversation. Um, an unrelated work where this happens is uh, Louis C.K.'s Horace and Pete, a phenomenal series if you haven't uh, watched that. highly recommend that as well. Uh, that's a whole other fucking crazy trip. Uh, but there's a thing where... It's just kind of like a Trump versus not Trump because I think it came out like 2016. Uh, but they like talk and you hear other people's points. And uh, that was only because it was like intervened because it was the way internet conversations go. It's just like screaming and screaming and screaming. And it's like, what bothers me is here's the thing like, for any murder and like, a Black Lives Matter support, I fully support anybody screaming at anybody who disagrees. That That's a whole not other thing. Like, if you're too fucking stupid and you're saying, like, terrible things, then you deserve to be yelled at, absolutely. Like, I understand that sometimes it calls for it. Um, but s- that's never gonna change anybody's mind, is attacking them. And I think that if Donald Trump has done anything... <laughs> I guess in his terms, successfully. It's just that. Um, It's that anybody who is anti him or any of the views just gets so extreme at people. 
I mean, this is just through like looking through comments on stuff. I haven't dealt with this in person. Um, because why, you know, just like it's deteriorating enough. Um, but it's people on both sides. They just can't stop attacking. And if you're supposed to be on the good side and the right side, why are you acting like that? Um, I understand how infuriating it is for people to be wrong. I don't understand it as a, from a black perspective. I mean, I can openly admit that. I mean, I'm not fucking black. I'll never fucking get it. I know that. I didn't need this to teach me that. Um, but I can still understand the side of it. You know what I mean? But if you are trying to change someone's mind or trying to educate someone or trying to explain things to someone, you need to do it with care and respect. And I know that the people you would be talking to don't care and don't show respect, but you have to be the bigger person in this. As, as annoying and painful as that is to say, uh, you just you just can't. Be screaming from both sides doesn't get anything done. That is just a toxic relationship. And Lord knows I've been down that road. Um, there are definitely times when it's necessary. Again, don't get me wrong, but I, I think that if you want to look to this movie for anything, it's like, yo, this shit is complicated. The simple part is uh, the police shouldn't murder anybody, period, in any scenario, let alone... Uh, easily murder black people and get away with it. Um, pretty much that simple. But uh, the movie also says, like, yo, as far as just, like, day-to-day relations go, yeah, there's some nuance and some trickiness to that. But we can all agree that people shouldn't be fucking murdered and should be able to live their lives with rights like everybody else. Uh, I, got, I guess I had to warm myself up a little bit to kind of get into the mode of talking about it. <laughs> Took me the whole hour. Didn't think that I would be talking about the movie the whole time, frankly, but it's just really that fucking good. Um, I really fucking love it. Um, this wasn't as funny as I would have liked. Uh, some people would probably say that about a lot of the episodes. Uh, but that's okay. Um, staying topical is more important. Um, yeah, get out there, do some shit. There's more that I could say. I think you get <laughs> my general depiction of the whole thing. If I need to say more, maybe I'll come up with it. But, again, not really my lane to even be in. I'm trying to let everybody else do their thing. But this was a nice little uh, therapy session for me to have. Also fucking great that I could talk about that movie. Because, fuck, it's good. Um... Yeah, I feel like I left a whole bunch of shit out, too, so I might have to do, like, a do-the-right-thing two-parter. <laughs> might have to come back to it. Um, look, I'm going to get out of here. This has been cool. It's been nice uh, to do an episode again. Probably going to be back on the weekly game um, going forward. Uh with that, I do want to clarify one more time that uh, I, that does not mean things are just back to normal. Just like with the fucking pandemic, protests also don't mean that things are back to normal from that also. Also, we don't want to ever go back to normal because normal is horrifying. So let's just say that as well. Uh, but no, there's still a pandemic going on and there's still a massive and finally Black Lives Matter movement going on i think the thing is just like this generation four years ago we just like weren't old enough you know what i mean four years ago i would have been down to break windows and like not you know what i mean peace peaceful wouldn't have been in my mind i would have been in the bad apple group of people doing the dumb shit uh i think that you know we're just not i i mean at least i hope that that's what I can count on is that like once we get rid of all this boomer bullshit, we can move past it and we can make this country ours for once. I think that we finally, as a generation, have our shit together. Now, there's definitely a bunch of fucking idiots that uh, <laughs> put a big damper on that. Don't get me wrong, but I think uh, I think maybe we're finally going in, the, in a good direction, hopefully, but 
We'll see what it unfolds. But by any means, do not divert any attention or focus. On the matter, I'm not doing so as well either. As well. Whatever. Who gives a fuck? It's been a long time. Um, Yeah. So I'm going to fucking roll out of here. Go watch Do the Right Thing. Please. Do yourself a favor. And uh, when you go to do that, remember that I are fat, you are fat, we are fat. Calculator.